Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this RSET webinar on monitoring water quality using satellite image processing. My name is Amita Mehta and I will be conducting this webinar series along with my colleague Africa Flores from NASA's Applied Sciences Surveyor Global Program and also from University of Alabama at Huntsville. So overall training objectives are listed here but to begin with, there is a prerequisite for this webinar series. Last year, RSET presented a webinar series on introduction to remote sensing of harmful algal blooms or HEBs. And here is the address for this webinar series. Um, not only there is introduction about HEBs, but there is session two that describes a number of NASA satellites and sensors which are relevant for monitoring HEB from remote sensing observations. So we recommend that you review this session. And with that, building on that webinar, now this a little more advanced webinar series has the specific objectives that we're going to focus on monitoring chlorophyll A concentration and water temperature. So either sea surface temperature or water body temperature in inland lake uh, to as indicator of harmful algal bloom. Specifically, you will have uh, experience of working with some of the data sets. We will work with uh, Aqua Satellite MODIS sensor, and we'll talk about these sensors soon, and Landsat OLI um, sensor images for uh, monitoring water quality. And then we will also look at a software, CDAS, and using this software, you'll be able to uh, do image processing of from Aqua and Landsat satellite sensors such as MODIS and OLI. So the emphasis here is on HEB monitoring. So we're going to focus on chlorophyll A concentration and SST, but the important part is that you will have um, experience in working with this data. You will have exercises that you will be conducting towards the end of each session where you will be using different tools and software to work with the data. There will be three sessions. Each one will be approximately two hours. Today, we will have an overview and analysis of NASA remote sensing data for water quality monitoring. So here also, we will look at some of the specific tools for you to work with data. Next week, there will be an introduction to CDAS software, which is used for image processing and data analysis. And last week, there will be image processing or image analysis exercise using CDAS. This will be useful uh, to learn how to use satellite remote sensing data along with in situ data to derive water quality algorithm for the region of your interest. So concept you will learn here in these three weeks. So we hope that uh, this will help you in deriving your own water quality products using remote sensing data. Here's the outline for today. Those of you who are not familiar with RSET will start with an introduction to Applied Remote Sensing Training Program RSET. Then we will talk about remote sensing of water quality, a little bit of background about that. Then monitoring water quality in coastal and inland waters. In this, we'll focus on demonstration of uh, two of NASA web tools for water quality data access. And these are Geomani and Ocean Color Web. We will focus on chlorophyll A concentration and water surface temperature. So what we will do is we will have case study of Chesapeake Bay. Uh, there was algal bloom earlier this year in May. So we will look at this case study using these two uh, web tools. And then uh, you will be able to do an exercise using the same tools and you will be analyzing uh, a, and downloading some of the data on chlorophyll A concentration and sea surface temperature. And that case study will focus on Lake Victoria in Africa. So we'll start about our set. So NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, it's set up to empowering the global community through NASA remote sensing training. It's part of NASA's Applied Sciences program, and the trainings are designed 
for policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals in public and private sectors. Specifically, RSET provides uh, trainings in these thematic areas, such as air quality, water resources, disasters management, and ecosystems and land uh, management. We have a number of team members in RSET uh, scattered at different NASA centers uh, here at Goddard, then at Ames in California, GPL, and also at uh, Huntsville, NASA Martian Space Flight Center. RSET trainings um, started in 2012, and as you can see, since then, uh, 100 trainings have been conducted, and more than 13,000 participants have taken these trainings from 106 plus countries. Uh, overall, more than 3,700 uh, and more organizations have participated in the trainings, and you can see for each different themes as you progress through years, more and more participation and attendance um, has, uh, have participated in RSET trainings. Also to note that these trainings are online, such as this one. It could be introductory or advanced, or there are online and in-person trainings, which are also introductory and advanced. Um, so this particular webinar is an advanced webinar series in which you will learn to access some of the data. These um, webinar series listed here from RSET um, are specifically for water quality monitoring. There was an introduction to remote sensing for HABs, as we mentioned. There were earlier webinars which were also about remote sensing of coastal and ocean uh, remote sensing and also introduction to water quality monitoring. This provides information of a number of satellite and sensors, how remote sensing is done and how it is useful and applied for water quality monitoring. So here is just a list that you can go and review these webinars at your convenience. Also, this is the website. All the training material is available from this website. This current webinar uh, series is material, uh, presentation slides, all the exercises, homework, all that will be available uh, from uh, this site. And also, a uh, recording of this session will also be available uh, after the session. Lastly, there is a listserv that if you haven't signed up for, we recommend that you do, because that way you can keep up with upcoming RSET trainings and other activities that RSET conducts throughout the year. Also, at this point, um, I want to make sure that uh, those of you who attend all three sessions in this webinar and complete homework exercises posted on our website, they will be awarded a certificate of completion. Um, and you will be given more information about this uh, towards the end of this webinar. With that, we start with remote sensing of water quality. So remote sensing of water quality it basically depends on measuring radiation from space. So satellites carry a number of sensors or different types of instruments. They either measure reflected solar radiation or infrared and micro radiation emitted by Earth. And you can see the spectrum here. Here is the optical or uh, visible light that is reflected by Earth's surface and atmosphere. So satellite sensors can measure that reflected sunlight. Or Earth's surface and atmosphere, they emit infrared and microwave uh, radiation that can be measured. And then these radiation uh, measurements are converted backwards to understand more about uh, water quality parameters, as we will see. So primarily, water quality affects water optical properties. What happens is that a dissolved or suspended matter in water, they change color of water. That means optical property changes, and that is visible through change in colors. So when um, change in color is noted, then it is realized that water property is changing, water quality is changing. So remote sensing can 
be used to monitor water color, and that indicates water quality. So uh, dissolved and suspended matter, um, they change, like such as dissolved organic matter include tannin, um, they're coming from leaves, roots, and plants, and they change color of the water. Suspended matter, such as clay or undissolved minerals, plankton, or even algal blooms, they also change uh, color of the water, as uh, shown here in the bottom picture. And some special herbs, which have unique colors, and you must have heard about red tides in oceans or coastal oceans. Um, so they have unique colors that help identify water quality. So basically, it is the change in water quality that changes water's optical properties. And that is measured as change in color by satellite sensors. And that helps us in monitoring water quality. So number of factors, they cause change in water quality. First of all, nutrient loading or eutrophication, they can help, they can change water quality. Pollution um, can change water quality. Water temperature also affects uh, water quality, especially have warmer water um, is more conducive for algal bloom. Uh, food web change, introduction of new species in the water body, they can change water quality also. And Changes in water flow is also a major cause of change in water quality. And that's true for herbs also, that um, runoff going into a water body changes because of hurricanes, droughts, or flood events, and that changes uh, water quality. A number of satellites are currently available. They are useful for monitoring water quality, and they are listed here. There is Landsat. 7 and 8. It's a long flying Landsat mission, but 7 and 8, they're available since uh, April 1999 and flying currently. There is also a Landsat 9 already planned. Uh, there, is, there are two more satellites, Terra and Aqua. These are also long term satellites, uh, 1999 onwards and 2002 onwards, respectively. There is SUMI National Polar Partnership or SNPP satellite, uh, which started in 2011. Also, there is a second um, joint polar uh, satellite system or GPSS that also started in 2017, and that is also uh, flying right now. There are European Space Agency satellites. These data are available, um, they are open source also, and they are Sentinel 2A and 2B, uh, launched respectively in 2015 and 2017. Um, and Sentinel 3A, which was launched in February 2016. So these satellites, a set of satellites, they are relevant for monitoring water quality. Not only that, they're all open source data, and they are available from different websites. Um, if you, when you review the prerequisite webinar, you will be able to see each and every uh, satellite information um, in that webinar. But the summary is provided here. The satellites, Landsat 7 and 8, Turn Aqua, uh, Sumi and PP, um, Sentinel 2A, 2B, and 3A, all these are polar orbiting satellites. They provide measurements from pole to pole. And they have these specific sensors. They are helpful for water quality monitoring. Landsat 7 has Enhanced Thematic Mapper, or ETM+. Plus. Operational Land Imager only on Landsat 8. Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer or MODIS on Terra and Aqua. And Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite in VIRS. That's in uh, NDP. And Sentinel 2A and 2B, they carry Multispectral Imager or MSI. And Sentinel 3A, they carry, it carries Ocean and Land Color Instrument or OLCHI, it's known as. Now, all these um, sensors, uh, they have different spectral bands, number of bands, their band width, and band resolution, they're different. And they're all listed in Appendix A for more information. To, information to note here is that all these satellites, they have different spatial and temporal resolutions and coverage. Landsat 7 and 8, they have relatively narrow swath, about 180 
5 kilometers but have relatively higher pixel resolution ranging from 15 meter to 60 meter nominally data are available at 30 meter that we are going to look at modis has uh, and uh, rears they both have broader swaths uh, 2330 here for modis 3040 kilometers for rears so these are broad swaths covering larger area but then the pixel resolution here is moderate ranging from 250 meters to about one kilometer for modis and it's 375 to 750 meter for veers on the other hand if you look at landsat the revisit time is 16 days but terra aqua modis provide coverage on one to two day so here are some of the differences uh, it's true for sumi npp2 that it is a polar orbiting one to two day uh, revisit satellite uh, sensor Sentinel-2, A and B, uh, has 290 kilometer swath, uh, relatively narrower, but then pixel resolution is higher, as you can see, 10 meter, 20 meter, 60 meter, and five day revisit time. Sentinel-3A, again, is moderate resolution, 300 meter, and also revisit time is 27 day, has a somewhat broader swath up 12 70 kilometers so as you can see here these satellites they all have different features but they can all be used in combination to observe water quality and that way they uh, they can be useful some of the advantages of using remote sensing for monitoring water quality and they are listed here First of all, uh, they're available for large regions. As you can see in the right-hand side, these are in situ measurement. This is in Gulf of Mexico. You can see that there are limited uh, observations. Uh, also, they can be infrequent. They're not very frequent because just the logistics of taking in situ um, measurements. Whereas satellite that's shown here in Gulf of Mexico, they provide uh, continuous special coverage, large scale coverage also, it's more frequent than in situ measurements. In case of MODIS and VIRS, it would be almost one, to, uh, one or two days. So they're more frequent and provide much better special coverage. Also has long time series and data continuity. It's the same satellite and sensor that's measuring this area. So say Landsat and um, Aqua and Terra, they have been flying since 1999 onwards and then you get this long time series so you can look at climatology of different water quality parameters uh, also they're consistent in the sense that if you have in situ measurements at different places different instruments are used with different calibration so it's hard to uh, compare one uh, water quality in one place to another place because instruments are different their quality and their calibration may be different on the other hand satellite uh, measures with the same sensor it's measured everywhere so there is consistency in measurement that when you can there's a comparability also among different countries and different places uh, there are many different types of uh, measurements available from satellite also um, um, then also there is a compatibility or complement that traditional statistical methods can be used with satellite data um, data processing is done in such a way that you can also have uniformly gridded data, as we will see. And so it, they're easier to use that way. Um, many satellite data that most that we are going to talk about, they're all open source. There are also other data sets. Um, they have um, commercial use and they are, one has to pay for those. But the one we are talking are uh, freely available and there are open access data. So some of the water quality indicators observed from satellites are listed here. Turbidity and sediments, they can be um, detected from remote sensing. Color dissolved organic matter or CDOM. Sea surface temperature, chlorophyll A or phytoplankton. And salinity, total suspended solids, fluorescence line height, we'll see about that, what it is, and euphotic depth. 
these are some of the parameters they are observed from the satellites that we just talked about. And here is just an example of Sumi NPP Weir's uh, measuring uh, phytoplankton bloom in Gulf of Alaska in 2016, June. As you can see clearly this green area, they indicate where uh, phytoplankton have bloomed. So typically, um, the sensors that we talked about, uh, they have optical and infrared spectral bands, and they are used for monitoring water quality. All the sensors that we talked about from ETM, Oli, Modis, Veers, MSI, and Olchi, uh, they provide uh, uh, spectral measurements in optical and infrared bands. And these measurements then have been used for open oceans, coastal oceans, uh, many estuaries, and inland lakes uh, to monitor um, water quality parameters that we talked about in the previous slides. This animation is from uh, NASA's early satellite CVIFs. Uh, this has this was launched for ocean color monitoring, and this shows annual cycle of chlorophyll A concentration. And you can see that um, how it changes with time. And so um, this is a climatology actually from CVIF. Now we are going to focus on how actually light interacts with water and how what is actually measured to, to derive water quality parameters, what is required. So sunlight, when it strikes the water surface, what happens is um, radiation can be absorbed and re-emitted or reflected or it's scattered. So absorption um, is by phytoplankton in the water, other non-algal particles in the water, and color dissolved organic matter. And water itself, they all absorb some of the solar sort of radiation. Backscattering can happen in forward and backward direction. So that there is, after all the processes is done, there is water leaving uh, radiation that is measured by satellite sensors. And that is the in, measured in terms of remote sensing reflectance. So this is the quantity that is used. So it's the reflected or reflectance that is received by the sensor that is used to derive water quality. And here it, it shows in terms of scattering and absorption how reflectance is derived. Also, it is important to note that it is with respect to what radiation is coming in. So it's the, it's the fraction of that radiation that is reflected back that is measured by the sensor. Inherent optical properties or IOPs, which they reflect color of the water, so absorption by different um, water quality parameters, as listed here, and light, they help in identifying colors of the water. So IOPs, they change with different water quality parameters. So, so here, this is chlorophyll, so absorption and scattering, they reflect what kind of uh, what water quality parameter is there. This is just blue water. This is chlorophyll with green. This is sea dome, and this is non-algal uh, sediments. So you can see different colors um, in, in reflectance when uh, it received by the sensor. And here also it shows that this is the wavelength, uh, and here's the reflectance. And as you can see, different constituent has different reflectance in different spectral bands. So by knowing this information, these some of these parameters, water quality parameters, can be derived based on reflectance. So here you have a broader peak for sediment in visible light uh, in reflectance spectrum. Water is here in blue. This is sea dome, and then there is this is chlorophyll. So once you know uh, how reflectance and uh, is changed in, in different bands due to these constituents, you can develop algorithm to get these parameters back from the observed reflectances.
And there are basically two uh, methods used in getting uh, water quality from remote sensing. One is a qualitative technique, or it just provides qualitative information, in which satellite images can be viewed uh, every day or every time there is an overpass of satellite over the water body of your interest. And if the, you can see changing color, then you know that water quality is changing. So this is just visually inspecting how water color is changing provides you information about changing water quality. Quantitative method, on the other hand, is a little more involved. In this, you really have to know um, reflectance, actual measured by the sensor. Uh, you also want to know absorption and scattering properties of uh, the water or medium between water and the satellite. This is atmosphere. And what happens is you, you need in situ observations uh, where you want to develop quantitative information. So you take um, in situ measurements, take remote sensing measurements, and derive algorithm to relate these two to derive quantitative information. And we'll see how to do that. So here, what is shown here, again, is this is the spectrum, and this is the radiance. Now, this is the energy um, um, spectrum is shown. So total. Um, this is sensor uh, looks at total radiance. This is the water or surface reflectance and water living, and this is the atmosphere. So when the satellite sensors, they actually see a combination of what is coming from the surface, so water, um, other water pro quality properties, atmosphere, and so total what you see here top of the atmosphere radiance is their combination of surface atmospheric gaseous molecules clouds and aerosol particles they're all combined information with the surface and so in order to look at just water reflectances to derive contribution from water one has to remove uh, atmospheric contribution and that is called atmospheric correction for water quality monitoring so satellite observations of radiance or reflectances, they are corrected by using radiative transfer modeling. And there are various techniques uh, they exist, uh, and they actually do require information about radiative transfer, um, information about atmospheric conditions, uh, clouds and aerosol conditions. They re are required to do these corrections. There are uh, uh, several examples shown here. Uh, of the algorithms which provide atmospheric correction. Uh, NASA Ocean Biology Processing Group has a algorithm, radiative transfer algorithm. You can get more information here, uh, which is used to derive NASA ocean color data, uh, atmospheric corrected data. There is a second simulation of satellite signal in the solar spectrum, or 6S. This has also been used um, to correct um, water living radiances for water living radiances or atmospheric correction. Ecolite, uh, this is from uh, Belgium, and hydrolite, this, these two are also um, used for uh, correcting radiances for atmospheric correction. There is also a paper here that you can uh, review to just get basic concept of how atmospheric atmospheric correction is done. And all these websites provide uh, ample details of what is involved in atmospheric correction. These codes are also open source that you can download and use in your own region with remote sensing observations. So, so here is the summary of how water quality parameters are derived from remote sensing observations. So this is the quantitative technique. What is involved is algorithm development part in which satellite top of the atmosphere reflectances over the water body of interest are collected. Uh, preferably, they co-located and coinciding in time with in situ observations in the same water body. So for each satellite overpass, a time series of observations from remote sensing and in situ measurements, they're built. 
The satellite data are corrected for atmospheric contribution. And water living reflectances are then combined or they are derived statistical or empirical algorithm in which in situ data are also used. So this is the algorithm development part. And the algorithm development results in model coefficients or relationship between in situ and satellite measurements, which then can be used with um, satellite remote sensing reflectance over the water body to derive water body par parameter. So here you have point in situ measurements, but the model then can be applied everywhere where there is remote sensing information. So that way you are providing a nice, you are getting a nice special coverage um, based on remote sensing and based on the methodology derived based on in situ and remote sensing measurements. So this is the basic concept of what you would uh, used to derive quantitative information about water quality parameters. And what we're going to do is in session two and three, we are going to go through some of these steps where we will actually look at uh, atmospherically corrected reflectances and we'll also have example of getting in situ data and how they can be correlated. So this will be demonstrated um, throughout this webinar series. So here is an example of how uh, chlorophyll concentration was derived by using Weir's reflectances. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a number of uh, curves. So this, these are wavelengths here, and these are uh, surface reflectances. And so reflectances are given for each wavelength here uh, over the spectrum. You can see ranging from blue all the way to red. Um, and different curves they are for different chlorophyll concentration higher the chlorophyll concentration uh, more green light is reflected back and so as you go from top here to bottom curve you are actually decreasing chlorophyll concentration and in the green band here you can see reflection uh, reflectance changing also note that the band reflectances between blue and green they change so ratio of these actually that indicative of chlorophyll concentration so as we saw in the previous slide this ratio is used with in situ data to derive a regression relationship or statistical relationship uh, to derive chlorophyll concentration and here on the right hand side then it is shown uh, as a validation that this is the in situ chlorophyll A concentration and this is the Weir's derived chlorophyll A concentration based on the model coefficients derived from these band ratios. And as you can see, um, it lines up quite well, the uh, remote sensing and in situ uh, chlorophyll concentration. So this is basically how uh, you would use um, an remote sensing data and in situ data to derive uh, the algorithm and then also use this algorithm and validate it with independent data. So this is basically an overview of number of satellite and sensors which are used for water quality monitoring and basic concept of what is required uh, for getting quantitative information from remote sensing observations to get derived algorithm and how to uh, come up with your own algorithm and how to use in situ data com combination with remote sensing data um, then to derive uh, water quality parameter. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have monitoring water quality and coastal and inland waters. There's a um, number of things to consider here. Um, as we saw, there are multiple satellites available. So how to choose? First of all, uh, geographical and atmospheric conditions where you want to measure water quality, um, you can see which satellite would be useful. If it is very cloudy, uh, Landsat coming every 16 day may be less useful, but MODIS, so Aqua and Terra and SNPP providing daily uh, information, you, can, you have a better probability of finding cloud-free condition. And 
this is important to note that most satellites and sensors we talked about, uh, they use optical um, measurements. So if it is cloudy, then it's difficult to see the surface. So based on that, uh, one has to do a composite of satellite data uh, to derive uh, water quality parameter. Also, spatial resolution is important. If it is open ocean, then any of the satellites would be useful. But if it is a small lake uh, or it's like estuary, then it is difficult to see from uh, moderate resolution such as uh, MODIS uh, with 250 meter to one kilometer resolution, but Landsat with 30 meter resolution can resolve some of the lakes. And uh, it is considered that you need at least three clear pixel in water to be able to derive water quality of a, a water body. So that is something to keep in mind. Temporal resolution also matters how frequently um, you can monitor a water body, uh, how frequently you can get a non-cloudy picture, which will provide uh, information to you. Uh, spectral Bands and resolution also matter uh, in accuracy and how to derive different measurements. Uh, also, the mission length, in, it helps in deriving algorithm if you have a longer time series. And also, mission continuity is important. If you want to do operational monitoring, you can do it how long the mission is going to continue. So depending on these number of um, factors, you may want to use with satellite to use. Also, a, you can also use combination of different satellites and sensors to monitor a water body. So there are um, data sets available from some of the sensors that we talked about. So NASA Ocean Color Web, that is from Ocean Biology Processing Group. And here's the website. This site was primarily designed for coastal and open ocean monitoring, but it's also been used to monitor large inland lakes and estuaries, as we will see. So this site provides historical and current data for um, ocean biology, especially chlorophyll A concentration and sea surface temperature are available from this site. And we are going to focus on these two parameters. So um, as you can see, we will have a demonstration of this site, and we will go over some of the data, how to access this data, and how to then uh, analyze this data. So NASA ocean color data products are listed here. All the algorithms are provided here. And as you can see, chlorophyll concentration, diffuse attenuation um, coefficient for downlit downwelling irradiance, um, also inherent optical property, particulate organic carbon, particulate inorganic carbon, and photosynthetically available radiation, instantaneous photosynthetically available radiation, normalized fluorescence line height, and remote sensing reflectance. All these are available from optical bands. In addition, Sea surface temperature based on infrared um, bands are available. Um, and so these are all available. And how they are derived is given in this document. But also important to note is that um, in situ measurements used uh, to derive these algorithms are uh, also uh, available from here. It's from CBAS. This is the site. So these were ship ship measurements, they were used in deriving algorithms. So basic algorithm for chlorophyll, that is a fourth order polynomial. Um, this is based on MODIS and Weirs, and it uses reflectances in blue and green band. So this is the formula used. Logarithm of this band ratio and a fourth uh, order polynomial. This is derived by uh, relationship between band ratios and in situ measurements from CBAS. And then these coefficients are used um, to derive chlorophyll concentration everywhere in the water bodies. Similarly, SSDs are derived from infrared window radiances. And there are also algorithms described for organic carbon, 
uh, this is a simple power law. Again, it's in um, blue and green um, bands. Similarly, inorganic carbon uses two or three band um, as shown here. So a lot of uh, details you can find in the document. Um, and if you have any questions, you can bring the questions back. But basic algorithms, they used um, multiple band ratios or information combined from different bands to derive these alg algorithms based on CBAS um, measurements, in-situ measurements. Additionally, there is diffuse attenuation coefficients or KD490 that we just saw. This is useful because it indicates how strongly light um, intensity at a given wavelength is attenuated within a water column. And so this is really a characteristics of water optical property and that it helps in identifying a type of water case one and case two in this case. Um, and um, it's, it's a critical parameter to know accurate estimation of the light intensity at depth in the water column. Useful for measuring turbidity and transparency of water. And so this is really, a, uh, again, it's a uh, empirically derived algorithm, but this is a useful parameter to look at um, optical property of water. And there is normalized fluorescence line that we mentioned earlier. So this also is useful, especially it, it, it helps in resolving uh, phytoplankton estimates and also it helps in, in characterizing iron stress in the global ocean. So this is a measure of solar induced phy phytoplankton chlorophyll fluorescence emission at this particular wavelength. And again, it is derived based on uh, this particular wavelength measurements with respect to in-situ line, uh, in-situ measurements also. And so um, this is one additional parameter that can help you in uh, looking at uh, photosynthesis in, in water body. There are also, there's also this um, paper that is referred to here a couple of years ago. It provides a, an overview and review of different satellites, sensors, and spectral bands used for deriving different water quality parameters. This is just for your information. In addition, uh, NASA ocean color data based on MODIS and VIRS, um, and um, also based on Landsat 5, 7, and 8. These are used by many, many investigators for different lakes and estuaries also to derive water quality. And so uh, you, you will see references in this paper which use some of these um, data to derive water quality parameters. So now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on monitoring HAP. So we want to look at chlorophyll A and temperature data. So just a summary of what HABs are. Um, so HABs are basically colonies of algae which grow out of control. It, they can be in uh, fresh or seawater. They, they are just plants. And some of them can be toxic. Uh, HAB really cause economic losses because they affect ecosystems and uh, fisheries. They contaminate um, drinking water, so they are health hazard. And they deplete oxygen in the water. They attenuate light so that they affect submerged vegetation and corals also. So this is why it is important to measure or monitor HEB just to look at the impact of water and economic impact of HEB on uh, aquatic life and also on human life. So generally, chlorophyll A concentration is used uh, for HEB indicator and also temperature because warmer the temperature, more conducive to grow HEBs. Chlorophyll A anomalies or departure from mean also is a good indicator of changing HEB and so that also is used for monitoring HEB. So what we are going to do is we are going to focus on chlorophyll A concentration. And we're going to demonstrate this by using these two tools, Giovannian Ocean Color Web. These two tools are um, useful 
for looking at already made uh, chlorophyll A concentration from Modis and Weir's. Um, and so you can do spatial and temporal subsetting. You can analyze and visualize uh, data. You can do so without downloading, or you can even download the data. So for the case study, what we are going to use is Chesapeake Bay. And then you will have exercise over Lake Victoria. So I'm going to share my screen to show um, Giovanni first and then ocean color. And we're going to focus on Chesapeake Bay to see how we can look at chlorophyll A concentration. So I'm going to show a demonstration of Giovanni and then uh, NASA Ocean Color Web. So here's the Giovanni website. Those of you who have taken RSET uh, trainings before, you are you must be familiar with Giovanni. Here is the application speci specifically for chlorophyll A concentration. Here you can search for many different parameters available through Giovanni. We're interested in chlorophyll, so we're searching by keyword chlorophyll. Once you search by keyword, you can see all the options, dif different sources of chlorophyll A concentration. And what we're going to look at is chlorophyll A concentration from Modis Aqua, which is four kilometer, and here is the beginning and end date. You also you have monthly as well as eight day. You also see normalized fluorescent line height from Modis. Concentration of particulate organic carbon. And you also see absorption coefficient. You can see backscatter coefficient and particulate organic carbon again at eight day resolution. But we're going to focus on monthly chlorophyll A concentration from aqua modis. We're going to pick Chesapeake Bay as our case study. You can zoom in and pan the map by using these features. And you can make a box around the area of your interest. This covers Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that it comes up with latitude, longitude. If you have exact latitude, longitude you are interested, you can enter those two. We're going to look at time series of chlorophyll A concentration. So from the top, we have chosen area average time series. Here it is going from 2002 to 2018 May. And plot data launches a workflow. So this is preparing time series. And you already have this time series here. You can see from 2002 all the way to 2018 May. It's in milligram per meter cube. And you can see variation. The general range is between 5 to 6. That's the average milligram per meter cube. But you can see spikes going all the way up to about 7, 7.5 milligram per meter cube. The recent spike is in May of 2018. You can download this data. For that, you have to log in to NASA Earth data. You can register by going here. If you already have an account, you can log in to NASA Earth data. And this allows you to download the data. So data are free, but user registration is required. You can download CSV file of the time series. This is an Excel file that gives you year and concentration, chlorophyll concentration. Or you can download image. Here you can go back to data selection. We're going to look at May 2018. 
in detail. We're going to look at map of this month. I've already entered these dates and I'm going to choose time average map from this map I, uh, option. Once you plot the data, you get the map. You can see the scale here and color bar. Notice the multiplication factor here. So this range is from 13 to say about 64 milligram per meter cube. And the color shows where there is high concentration of chlorophyll A. You can also see places where you don't have data. You don't see any uh, chlorophyll A values. And there are two reasons for that. Either there can be clouds or just the resolution um, is not enough to resolve this. It's, there's contamination from land and it's not derived. So that could be multiple factors. But in the bay, you can clearly see also in the Atlantic Ocean, you can see chlorophyll A values. Here you can see the place where you have high concentration. You can download this data either as NetCDF file or GOT file. You can you view them in QGIS or ArcGIS, or you can have a KMZ file, which you can view with Google Earth. And here's the Google Earth viewing KMZ file of Chesapeake Bay chlorophyll A concentration from Aquamodis. You can zoom in. And in, in, in the Giovanni, uh, when we downloaded, it showed the resolution was four kilometers. So you can see these boxes, which are about four kilometers. Here, this is much, this, this is narrower. And so four kilometer mode is, has a lot of land also in it. And so it's not, chlorophyll A concentration is not available here. It's available when you have clear view of the water body. So this is basically how you would use Giovanni to analyze chlorophyll A concentration data and download some of the data or view this data. We looked at time series. We saw where higher concentration was, and we then looked at map. Once you look at the map, then you can see, zoom in and see exact area where you have higher concentration of chlorophyll. These are the places where um, there is likelihood of more algal bloom. And you can also go back and look at more sea surface temperature in similar way using Giovanni. We are going to uh, look at that from NASA Ocean Color Web. So I'm going to switch to uh, NASA Ocean Color Web. So this next section or next demonstration is of Ocean Color Web. This is the NASA Ocean Biology Processing Group's website. And it has every information you need for getting NASA Ocean Color information, such as chlorophyll A and SSD, how the algorithms are derived, how, how the in situ measurements are taken, how the validation is done. So you can get more information here. All the missions are listed here. The current missions we talked about, such as Moody's Aquaterra, Pierce um, from um, SNPP and GPSS, um, Olchi from Satellite Sentinel 3. There are all the past missions, such as CWIPS, Maris, um, they are all given here. You can click on any of this and you will get information about sensor, about the time period of coverage, how to get data from this particular sensor, documentation, and the mission website. So this is the information about missions themselves and how to get the data. Derived data are available from this data link. And we are going to see this in some detail. But there are documentations in which all the products are described, especially um, level one, two, and three. The product that we saw from Giovanni was level three, 
which was uniform, uniformly gridded at four kilometers. Here in Ocean Color Web, all these levels are available. Um, and so we're going to look at level two data now, which are actually swath by swath pixel data. Uh, and so all these are available here. Information about data format and specification, algorithm descriptions, and other sources of data used here, it's all described in here. There is processing history and technical document. Um, so this is something where you will find details of everything that we're going to talk about, the parameters we're going to talk about, the data we're going to talk about. Services has information about software and tools. CDAS is something that we're going to look at in this webinar. So from next week onwards, we will be talking about and using CDAS. There are also other software libraries, such as IDL. Um, there are time series plotter. There's Chiovani listed here. Also, something useful he is here. This is the overpass predictor. If you already know that, if you are interested in a particular region, then you can pick any sensor here, Modis Aqua, and let's also pick Landsat 8 Oli, say. And here is this date, and here's the latitude and longitude. So for uh, example, let's just go from 8, so 8, 27th, 27th of August to say 1st of September. And for example, I am going to add 37 North and 78 um, West. So this is approximately in Chesapeake Bay region. Here's the daytime. Um, information daytime overpass and then here's it you can get it as text or or table so if you have inland lake or estuary you want to monitor you can you can enter latitude longitude and dates and it tells you once you submit query it takes a few minutes but here is a table i already have uh, it shows dates and time where set satellite will overpass. So this is Moody's Aqua and this is Oli. So between 27th of August and 1st of September, you have several Aqua Moody's overpasses over this particular region, whereas you don't have any Landsat overpass in this period. So if you are planning in situ measurements to coincide with satellite measurements, then this is a nice tool that you can use to look at when there will be satellite overpass, and then you can plan in situ measurements just around the same time so that you can correlate if you are interested in developing algorithm or you want to validate your uh, satellite-based algorithm or data. So that's a useful tool. So that is available through the services, and you can register um, as a user and you have data subscription um, here too. You have to log in using NASA Earth data here, but you can create a sub, uh, subscription. So if you have a particular region of your interest, you can log, you can go in here and you can create your region. So in here, suppose you say, and you can just select the region, say Lake Victoria. And then you can create this region and, and then make subscription so that every time there is an overpass here, you will get data for this particular part. So it will be given to you. So you go through this procedure to subscribe automatic data. So many features to look at. If you go to data though, which we, we want to focus on is that you have this interface of level one and two browser data and level through three browser data. We already looked at level three data from Giovanni, so we're going to focus here on level one and two data. 
And you can see here on the left hand side, there is direct data access. If you don't want to use this browser, you want to download bulk files, you can go here and download the data. You can search file um, and you can also, this is the CBAS um, field data. So these are the in situ data available through here too. There are the resources and how to cite this data and this particular website you can visit here. There is in, in, information about quality assessment. And again, this is the same overpass predictor we just saw. One more thing to notice here, and this is highly recommended, is that there is a forum. This is the uh, Ocean Color Forum. If you have any questions about data or software or files, you can post your questions here. And then uh, there is discussion and there are question answers in here. Uh, you can also visit this forum to already uh, view all the questions posted in there. So we're going to start with level one and two browser. So level one is just the um, raw measurements that satellite sensors does. Level two now is already geolocated and it is already in terms of geophysical parameters. So in this case, it is chlorophyll concentration and sea surface temperature as shown here. All the sensors are listed here. Uh, for example, we're just going to keep Modis Aqua here. Here you can see a number of options. First of all, you can pick how big a region you are going to pick. Uh, if you click on any or pick any region, um, how many kilometer radius that you are looking for for satellite overpass. You can also have um, your, your area of interest how many percent, how much percentage is covered by a swath? You, because we're just going to say any part. And then um, you can have also select if you want any in situ data from CBAS co located with your region, you can filter by that too. Here is the temporal selection. You have last three months here and then year and month here. What we're going to do is we're going to go to May of 2018. This is where we saw in Giovanni when we had um, larger chlorophyll concentration in recent months. Now, here also you can add uh, latitude, longitude of your area of interest, but there are also um, areas which are uh, already uh, available here. So, one or more region from here. These are pre-selected region. You can look at different ocean and here there is Chesapeake Bay. So we're going to pick that. Once you do that, you can find swath. And that provides you, you can see there are many swaths available uh, since for this. And you can look at the picture by clicking on it. So this is 31st of May, just for example, I'm showing this. Okay. And here is the color bar that tells you what chlorophyll A concentration is and what its surface temperature is. So you can see that it is about, green is about one milligram per meter cube, and then it goes up to about 30 in red. So here is, higher concentration, here is a little lower concentration, and it also shows where you are looking at, where the region is. It shows where you, so you can look at chlorophyll concentration and SST. This is SST. So you have sea surface temperature and you have chlorophyll concentration. So you can pick any region and see, you can also pick different swaths. You can pick the best swath of your interest. And what you will you can do is you can also download the data. You can go to these files. 
So ocean color is chlorophyllic concentration. This is inherent optical properties, and these are SSTs. What we're going to do is download ocean color file. You save it on your computer. This is a NetCDF file. This can be opened with CDAS, and that is what we're going to do next week. So you save this file on your computer, which I already have. Similarly, you can save sea surface temperature on your computer. And we are going to see these files next week uh, by using CDAS. Okay. So once you search for data according to spatial region and temporal region, you can then download the data. And then later on, you can analyze this using different software. You can just visualize it here, but you can do further analysis as we're going to do next week using CDAS. You can also use GIS if you like, um, or any other software such as IDL or MATLAB or R or Python. We are going to use CDAS, which is designed specifically to do processing of these data. So with that, this demonstration um, is concluded. So we looked at Giovanni and ocean color. We looked at Chesapeake Bay. We looked at chlorophyll A concentration. We looked at level three and level two data, how to download them, how to visualize them. Now what we're going to do is we're going to stop here. So you can download these two exercises from the pod. What you're going to do is you're going to repeat similar procedure for Lake Victoria. So here is the exercise for Giovanni, and this guides you. Here is the step-by-step -step instruction. Once you download this, you will use first Giovanni to get time series and map of chlorophyll A concentration over um, Lake Victoria. So we, you can start by going to the Giovanni website. Also, please note that uh, since many of us are trying to access these sites, both Giovanni and then later Ocean Color, it's possible that the site may be slow. And it may be possible that everybody cannot access data at the same time. But you have this entire week to finish this exercise. But at least you can get started for next half hour. You can go through part of Giovanni exercise and also then uh, ocean color exercise. Uh, I am going to uh, go through some of these while you also work. So please open Giovanni website on your website, uh, on your computer, in your browser. So this is the website. You will pick chlorophyll A concentration monthly from Aquamodis. Here's the name of the product. We're going to enter exact location. And when you click on this here, it shows the square uh, area that you picked here. You can zoom in and see. This is Lake Victoria. And enter data range from January 2003 to June of 2018. Again, to find this chlorophyll A concentration, you would enter chlorophyll here and pick this from multiple options, as we saw in the demo. So 
So once you pick the parameter, spatial and temporal selection, go to time series area averaged. And once you pick all of that, you can go to plot data. And we'll wait for a few catches up. If you have any questions in the meantime, you can type in the question and answer box. Once you enter everything and you plot data, actually a workflow will launch and you will get results. So the idea of this exercise is that you get experience in working with this site and working with this data. So please go ahead and follow it on your computer. Even if it is slow, please try to navigate through all the options. Even if it is slow, you will see that you, it will let you enter all the options. Only when you try to plot data, it may slow down. But you can uh, repeat this later. And during this week, you should be able to get through this exercise. There's some question and answers based on this Giovanni exercise, which is part of your homework one for the first week. So please try and go through this exercise. You can start it now. And then you, if you cannot go through the calculation because the site is slow, you can do it later. Since I've already done uh, some of the exercise before, I have an example. I, this is Lake Victoria, January 2003 to July 2018. And here's the time series that I got. Some of you uh, who already entered the data and you're using this site, you probably have the time series already. Based on this time series, you will answer uh, questions posted in the exercise document, and you will enter the answers in Google form that is available through our set website. And we'll talk about it at the end of this session. Once you have this, you can go back to data and try and get area averaged map, time averaged map, sorry. So instead of taking this entire period, I'm going to just pick a, a recent month in 2018. So let's just keep it at July for June for now. So this is average of May and June. And then you can say plot data. So this is the exercise that you're following. Something that we just went through. It's all given here step by step. And these are the questions that you will answer using Google Form, which is posted on our set website. And in a few minutes, we'll go through the second exercise, which is the ocean color exercise. Yes, so if you're getting a pop assist two variables, you're probably trying to select differences, but you want just a, a time averaged map or area average time series. So pick the uh, analysis uh, selection exactly as it is in the exercise. So the axis that you see on, on Giovanni plot, you see only years. But if you look at the time series, you can see the 
you can see that each point is marked here for each month. So yes, the changing of label is not possible in Giovanni, but you do have information. You can see each month marked as a symbol here. So although the axis is just here, you can see each month in here. What you can do is when you download this as a CSV file, you can plot this in Excel, and then you can put months if you like. You can change the axis. As I showed in the demonstration, notice that the resolution is four kilometer. So although MODIS resolution, pixel resolution is 250 meter, like, but for level three data, there's a composite and it's, it's over a larger region. So it's a uniformly graded four kilometer data. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this is just to get you started and to be able to navigate through the site, put all the options in and find what you want to. Then you have this entire week to complete this. And actually have you have two weeks to complete your homework. So you do have time just to go through these steps to get some experience in navigating through the site. So you can do it at your convenience if it is not working right now or it is slow. So here's the uh, map that I got for May and June of 2018, the chlorophyll A concentration over Lake Victoria. Actually, you can look at the options and change the color to make it look better. You also get minimum and maximum values here. Please note this multiplier. So this has to be divided by 100 in order to get the real number, real values, actual values. So you can change the color and replot. You can change things, then customize plot a little bit. You can zoom in and see. You can see here where the maximum chlorophyll is, mostly in the coastal region. So this was the beta version that worked fine. So hopefully some of you got time series and map using Giovanni. And now we can switch to the ocean color exercise. Now it's very important to complete both these exercises because the first one, Giovanni, you will need that to complete your homework. And this one is even more important because you will be downloading ocean color data that you will be analyzing by using CEDA software next week. So here is the website that we saw the demo about. And you will go to data and go to level one and two browser and make yourself familiar with all the features that we saw earlier. Keep modus, aqua. You can pick day and night, but we are going to be interested in day uh, images because we're looking at reflected visible light. So it's the daytime image that will be used. If you pick day and night, you will see multiple swaths, but we'll pick something that is day. You can keep this any part. So it says you can check both day and night, but we will be using daytime. On the other hand, if you have 
nighttime images, you can still use infrared window, 11 micron or even 4 micron, that emits radiation and that's used for SST. So chlorophyll concentration will be available only for day daytime images, but SST can be available from both. So calendar, if we select August 18, which gets highlighted here. And here, Lake Victoria is there in the pre-selected region. So you can pick Lake Victoria. For any other lake of your interest or coastal region of your interest, you can enter latitude longitude box in here. You can find swaths. So here is where you have all the spots. You can see multiple, you can click on each of them and you will see different dates available here. So I'm just picking a random date here, but you can see Lake Victoria here, and you can look at color bar as we saw earlier. So here is where you can see your swath is, and it's a zoomed in version for chlorophyll A concentration and for SST. We're going to analyze this in CDAS next week, but what you will do is click on the file which corresponds to August 4th. And you can download the chlorophyll A concentration file and SSD file as well. So notice that these are level two data. These are not uniformly graded data. So these are, uh, if you go back and look at here, if you actually pick any month, um, you should be able to see suppose you pick You can see that all these are level two data. You can see individual swaths from Aquamodis for this particular day, as opposed to level three data we saw in Giovanni, which was uniformly boxed, graded. So you will be downloading this data over Lake Victoria, the swath that goes over it. So you will pick 2018, this is the Julian day or day of year. And OC is the chlorophyll and SST is the sea surface temperature. So this exercise is mostly for downloading these two files and then we will look at them using CDAS next week. This site may also be slow, but you still have this entire week to get these two files. You can go through all the swaths and see um, 
how things are changing. But you can see different areas are covered differently. So this is the 4th August image that you will be downloading. Once you click on this 4th August image, you will be able to see all the files. And you can get OC and SSD files, which are Julian Day 216 for this year. So again, please make sure that you download exercise one for Giovanni and Ocean Color from the handout section, or they are also available on our set website. These two exercises you must go through between now and next session, because Giovanni exercise will help you answer your homework questions for week one, available on. Google form, the link provided here in the chat box and also on the website, our set website. And the ocean color exercise, you will have to download these files because our next exercise and homework will depend on this. So finally, we also want to point out something that has to be done before next week. So there is a document um, that you will see online. This is the CDAS software that is used for both visualization, customizing analysis, and for image processing, even getting satellite and in-situ data together. This is the main part of this webinar series. Earlier, we have covered you one in Ocean Color, but now we are going to focus more on CDAS software, which you must download on your computer. So once you go to Ocean Color, you will be able to go to CDAS site by clicking on CDAS through services. And you will also see a instruction on our website how to download CDAS. Once you go to CDAS, Make sure that requirement for your computer is met. Especially you need a version of Java. Um, you, can, you will need Python, Git. These three you need. So CDAS has a graphical user interface or GUI and also has a command line version. We are going to focus on the GUI. So by Clicking on download, you will be able to download for your operating system, if it is Windows or Mac or Linux. But we are going to install this visualization installer from here. So before next week, on your computer, you should have a version of CDAS. The latest one is 7.5.1. For your own operating system, please go ahead and download CDAS. So your homework for next week requires that you finish the ocean color exercise and download data for Lake Victoria and download CDAS. Then you can work on the Giovanni exercise, and you have two weeks before you can complete your homework one. So hope all that is clear. So we thank you for attending today's session. We will have a question answer session right now. So here is a question. Um, in terms of image processing, how different is to process an image from lens at 7, 8 compared to Sentinel 2, A to B images? So <clears throat> level 1 to level 2 conversion, that is different for both of both different missions. So we will see next week that in CDAS you can do lens at eight um, image processing through GUI, but Sentinel 2A and 2B are right now not available in CDAS. So for each mission, level one to level two conversion is special. I mean, that's where 
that is mission specific metadata metadata go in so uh, the question here the third one what is the solution for landsat okay. yeah. hi amita yes hi africa yeah. So I think there are some some questions also about uh, how to use uh, satellite data uh, to identify cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, can uh, briefly chime in to to provide a few uh, answers mm -hmm. on that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mita. Um, so. As Amita explained, it, the chlorophyll A is a good proxy for harmful algal bloom. Uh, however, there is a, some work uh, to identify specifically harmful algal bloom and uh, cyanobacteria using uh, trying to derive phycocyanin instead of uh, chlorophyll A. However, we need a specific bands, uh, which uh, most of the optical sensors do not carry, and uh, it has to be a specific width and uh, uh, Mary's, um, which was one of the sensors that uh, Amita presented about, uh, used to have this information. Mary's is not currently uh, collecting data, but that's one of the limitations, and that's why chlorophyll A is broadly used as a proxy uh, for harmful algal blooms. The identification of the species itself mostly is done in situ because we don't. We don't have the spectral information to derive uh, phycocyanin most of the time. Uh, but if you happen to have the, the appropriate spectral bands, uh, in theory, you could also extract phycocyanin. Uh, but usually, chlorophyll is, is used. So there's a question about Lancet 7 imagery gap. So there is, when there is imagery gap, there, okay, there is some overlap between seven and eight, so you can use eight. But there is this um, lines that appear in Landsat 7 ETM plus images, and there is no way around it. You can remove uh, certain parts of the image. Both seven and eight based NDBI are available. You have to be aware of the gaps and um, those lines that appear in ETM+. Plus. So once you're aware of that, wherever there are actual data, you can interpret that as actual data, or NDVI in this case. Uh, so, so if there's a question here, uh, could there be mathematical derivation to segregate the water quality parameters from each and every sensor, even if we have excess data for a combination of sensors? So actually, what we did was, this is just one sensor we looked at, Modis Aqua. But yes, in principle, you can have mathematical derivation for each one. And it has to be separately for each one for level two, because each has different resolution, uh, spatial and temporal. So the mathematical expression or relationship would be derived for each sensor separately. And it's the final product then you can combine from different sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, so question five. Um, you, NetCDF file, there are software you can open with, but for now, you just keep the file. We will open them using CDAS next week. You can use any GIS software. So QGIS is the open source. You can open NetCDF file with that, or Python or R software can open it. There is also a software by NASA. It's called Penapply. It's a open source software that you can download. I'm going to try and find Penapply. Information for you. Mm 
you can download this if you want to look at NetCDF file using Penapply in the chat box. And uh, question number six is about uh, using Landsat 8 and 2A to determine sediment, uh, sediment river in water body, and yes, it's possible. And uh, and just uh, share a publication there where you can check how Landsat has been used to monitor sedi sediment in the Mekong Basin. So the important thing to note here is that you do need in situ measurements initially mm -hmm. to derive this relationship between satellite data and actual parameter. And then you can use that information with mm -hmm. all other images that come now and in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. And uh, on the last week, we are going to work with uh, in situ data to do those calibrations. But yeah, it's kind of site specific. Okay, so for um, question seven, I think one variable is we should work if you're trying to do time series or map. Only if you are taking differences, then it's asking for two variables. For the time average map, if it's asking for more than one time, you can use two consecutive months. Yeah, and the following question is related to the uh, previous one to answer about how to use uh, satellite data for harmful algal blooms. And uh, I mentioned phycocyanin, which is a pigment that is present in the cyanobacteria. Uh, but to distinguish between two different types of species of uh, uh, harmful algal blooms, that's uh, still more challenging, and uh, you would need in situ observations to do that differentiation. Um, I would say as much as we can get is to differentiate between uh, algals and harmful algal blooms, uh, either using chlorophyll A or mapping phycocyanin, which are two different pigments. And um, phycocyanin is present in cyanobacteria. Amita, would you like to add to that one? No, no I think this is fine. So, um, mm -hmm. And so next question, it says for next week. Um, for next week, we're just going to use CDAS. Uh, we're not going to use the science data processing code. But we are going to show how to do that in the third week. Next week, we, we will talk about it, but we will not actually be using the science data code, science processing code. But in third week, uh, we will show how to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, the review paper that we talked about, you you can you can have innovative product based on the data that you collect. It, it is possible. It's just um, you you just have to be careful how you interpret your results. And and once you validate, yes. So obviously you can derive relationship between in situ data and then um, combination of Band products, if you like. I hope I understand your question. Yes, you will only download OC and SST for now.
Yes, and for the following one uh, regarding big pollution issues, yes, you can use uh, this type of information to monitor sedimentation and chlorophyll in inland lakes. Uh, but for that, you will need to be careful about the spatial resolution. Uh, in inland water bodies, usually uh, they are smaller, and uh, maybe Landsat and Sentinel-2 uh, will be more appropriate than the MODIS or BEERS. Yeah, so it does depend on mm -hmm. the size of the reservoir, and generally it is, it is recommended that you should have at least three clear pixels within your water so there's no land contamination or no partial pixel over land so then for small water bodies Landsat and sentinel 2 would be better and we'll we'll see in, in the end uh in the last week you know how many lakes you can see with Landsat and modus years mm -hmm. Yeah. And the uh, next question is, can we determine the chlorophyll content of inland lakes using this data? Um, yes, the last week we are going to see how to do specifically that uh, using Landsat data. Uh, again, you have to be careful about the special resolution and the algorithm that is being used. The products that we're seeing today, those were ocean color products, those are already generated information of chlorophyll content that had been generated for the ocean. So even though we have data uh, for large lakes like Lake Victoria, uh, the algorithms that are behind it were created for, for the ocean. And that's why calibration is needed. And uh, the CGAS platform that we are going to see later has the capability to do that calibration with its situ observation. And we are going to see that later. But yes, you have used satellite data to monitor chlorophyll uh, water in inland uh, water bodies. So that's an important point that uh, what uh, Africa mentioned, that the one that we showed to your work you're working already derived product. The algorithms are based on ocean color data. So the in situ data came from sea bass, cruise data, not from in inland lakes. So mm -hmm. you can use this for inland lake, but provided that for more accurate information, you need in situ data in that lake. And you mm -hmm. derive algorithm uh, using remote sensing and this in situ data for the lake you are interested in. So, uh, Africa, you can add to this, but total suspended solids, yes, you can look at from satellite data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as the constituent that is dissolving the water affects the color properties of the water, it's possible to monitor it. Otherwise, uh, it won't be possible. Uh, for example, so, there is chemical oxygen. Um, that, that that won't affect the optical properties of the water, so it won't be feasible to measure for, from satellites. So like phosphate, something that is sedimented, sedimentation, you can change its color or optical property, then you can, but something uh, that does not change color, like even I think um, if it like solar oxygen, uh, you cannot. Uh, mm -hmm. Total dissolved solids, only if they change color, then yes, you can. Mm -hmm. so like dissolved organic matter can you know, change color and then you can see. Again, I think one thing to keep in mind, and if you look at um, literature, you will see that when uh, complex water, where there is a lot of things going on, um, color can be changed because of number of water quality parameters changing um, really requires um, in situ data to clarify what's going on. Just remote sensing, just by looking at color of the water may not tell you very accurate information about each parameter if they're all present in high quantity.
So, so the question 15 from Giovanni, um, you will not see most of the lakes because the data available are level three and four kilometer resolution. So any lake that is bigger than four kilometers square may appear as one grid box. So Giovanni is not really ideal to use for small lakes. So Lake Victoria is a big lake, so you can see it. Um, great lakes can be seen, but if you but but for smaller lakes you won't see them in Giovanni. In ocean color swath level two swath data, you may be able to resolve more lakes. Even then, um, if the data if it is one kilometer more than one kilometer square maybe it will you can see it but to derive information then it's better to use landsat data if you have small lakes mm -hmm. yeah and the oh yeah, yeah go ahead the last question here is uh, similar of uh, identifying other pollutants in the water, like toxic metals, high metallic pollution in fluvial bodies. Again, it depends if it would change uh, the color properties of the water, and you will need, uh, as Amita mentioned, in situ observations as well to, to determine to, if it's uh, due to metals or to other constituents that are dissolved in the water. Uh, that's a good question, um, number 17. Uh, yes, usually uh, how the, these products are derived is that uh, you don't use the pixels uh, along the shores because they interfere with the um, bottom of the water body. And uh, instead of being measuring chlorophyll or sedimentation, you're actually measuring uh, most likely the bottom of the of the water body. Uh, so that uh, does matter, but uh, we are assuming here that we are measuring what is on the surface of the water. Um, so in the shallow water, yes, deflectance mm -hmm. is affected by the surface, then um, mm -hmm. you will not get very accurate information. Mm -hmm. So when satellite sees reflectance, if it is truly ocean, uh, the, the surface reflectance that you're seeing, then there's no problem if the surface, if water is so shallow that sunlight can go in and get reflected or scattered by the surface itself, the bottom surface, then you, know, you are misinterpreting that reflectance as water living reflectance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, a, a good parameter uh, to use for this is the KD490, uh, which measure, measures how the light uh, dissolves in the water column. So you can see like, uh, how, how the, the water is traveling and, uh, and most likely from where are you getting your, uh, your measurements. And, uh, but we always assume we are measuring from the surface of the water. So you have to make sure it's uh, pure water where you are looking and, uh, and no shallow uh, waters are along the shore. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Um, again, we apologize for the technical difficulty we had in between.
and this afternoon then from 4 to 6 Eastern time we will have the same webinar in Spanish that Africa first will be delivering and we will see you next week on 12th of September with the next session of this webinar again please download CEDAS on your computer also ocean color files on your computer so that we can work with them next week So thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Uh, this session will be closed now.